I respond again, nut bag, as Chief would say. Um, I also respond with, she's got a leaky balloon knot, uh, leaks poo. From all accounts, he didn't do anything wrong. She's a whack job. C-U-N-T. Objection. So don't spell it. You have to, so this, these are your words, Trooper Proctor? Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead and say them. Uh, yes, she's a babe. Weird Fall River accent, though. Though. No ass. That was Trooper Michael Proctor, the lead investigator in the Karen Reed case. He began his testimony yesterday, and it was an explosive situation. May it please the viewers, I'm Rich Schoenstein with True Crime MTN, and I want to talk about that testimony and the current status of the Karen Reed case, which you all know I've been following. Now, if this is your first viewing of the Karen Reed case, she is accused of backing up her SUV in the middle of the night into her then boyfriend, Boston police officer John O'Keefe, driving off and leaving him to die. But Reed's defense team says she didn't do that. And in fact, she was framed that John O'Keefe was injured or killed inside the home of Brian Albert, later dumped outside, and she's been made the perpetrator. So a divisive difference of opinion on the case. Yesterday, Trooper Michael Proctor of the Massachusetts State Police testified. So he was the lead investigator on the matter. His testimony was much anticipated. And I watched it live. And when he first came on the stand, I thought to myself, well, this guy seems cool. He seems reasonable. He seems credible. He's a little nervous, but he seems okay. He doesn't seem to really be connected to the Albert family, as I had been led to believe. So I'm not sure about that theory. Um, he had been brought in, the Massachusetts State Police had been brought in so that the Canton Police Department didn't investigate the death of John O'Keefe since it happened in front of the home of a police officer. That made sense. And I was thinking to myself, what's the big idea? Why has the prosecution been hiding this guy? And then I started hearing the text messages. And oh man, he is texting with a friend as he's doing his initial work on this investigation. He calls Karen Reed a whack job. He calls Karen Reed a C word, which by the way, he tries to spell when he gets to that part on the text and the judge makes him say the word out loud, not just spell it. He talks about her having a leaky balloon knot, which is a reference to a medical condition. He calls her a babe. He says she's got a weird Fall River accent. So he says a lot of nasty things right off the bat about Karen Reed. And then also he says in the same text string that there's compelling evidence against her, that there's going to be serious charges brought on the girl. And that's not all. There were other text messages that were brought into evidence in this case. Text with his sister, not as bad, but he's texting with his sister. Text later as he's searching Karen Reed's phone and he makes a comment that he has found no nudes so far, which is completely inappropriate. Text with his wife referring to Reed as a whack job. So there's a whole string of really ugly, really vile text messages. And to justify this, Proctor says, I understand they were unprofessional and regrettable. Unprofessional and regrettable. And let me tell you something. I've been down this road before. Jurors believe documents. Jurors believe text messages. They will believe that a text message shows the true nature of an individual much more than what the individual says on the witness stand. I've been in multiple cases just in the last year where text messages change the outcome. People texting their boyfriend, people texting their mother or sister. It doesn't matter. In fact, you might say, well, that's just a personal text, but jurors understand that the truth comes out in those personal texts. They believe things that you say to your boyfriend or mother or sister. And by the way, you can't really defend the text saying they were personal. I mean, if they were personal, why is he having personal texts about an ongoing homicide investigation? 
And some of those texts weren't personal. Some of the texts at issue here are texts with other police officers and even to his boss. And that doesn't seem very personal. So you can't just say, sorry, those texts were unprofessional. I mean, I got to tell you, unprofessional is the least of the problems with those text messages. Unprofessional is pretty far down my list of the problems with those text messages. Unprofessional is I forgot to call him sergeant. I called him mister. Unprofessional is not using the C word. Those messages are vile. They're misogynistic. There are words that should not be used in any workplace, let alone law enforcement in the middle of a murder investigation. They demonstrate that the investigator reached an immediate conclusion and judgment about the case. And as such, they bring the entire investigation into question. They reflect even more than a rush to judgment. They show actual bias, actual bias against the defendant, actual animus against the defendant, even in some of the texts, animus against the defendant's lawyer who isn't doing anything except his job of being a defense lawyer. Arguably, they show even more. Arguably, those texts show the complete lack of an actual investigation. He wasn't trying to figure out what happened. He was trying to gather evidence against Karen Reed. Now, the only thing I will say is what those text messages don't show me is a conspiracy or a cover-up, which has been promised by the defense, right? Those text messages, we don't see anything in the text messages where he's trying to you know, conspire with fellow officers to create a story that's not true. That doesn't seem to be what's going on. What seems to be going on is he quickly concluded that she was guilty and went about his business. Not that he was trying to frame her or cover up, but just that he was trying to gather proof about what he perhaps way too quickly determined. Now, all of those texts came out on direct examination. And it's a good idea if you're the prosecutor and you have this witness to get in front of the issue and to put out the text messages on direct rather than just let him be beaten up on cross. But I have to say they didn't do it very effectively. I mean, they literally just handed the guy a big set of papers with the text messages and had him go through them, read them and say that they were unprofessional. What the prosecution should have done is shown them in context gone through the series of events and shown that what was happening is this witness was angry about the death of a fellow police officer, felt that Karen Reed was guilty, felt that the evidence was compelling against her and was taking out some anger. Shown in context, it would have helped a little bit, although they're pretty indefensible text messages, to tell you the truth. We got through all of that direct and defense had about a half hour, a little less than a half hour of cross-examination. They went right in on the text messages. I, I thought they made a misstep by focusing on some of the text messages about Karen Reed's lawyer. That makes it personal. It shouldn't be about the lawyers. It should be about the parties. That was a misfocus. And overall, I don't think the cross-examination made it worse than the texts themselves, which are shocking. But I'm sure there's much more that, to come, right? They only got 30 minutes into this. And presumably, Alan Jackson's going to try to show that the texts support that conspiracy and cover-up theory. Not only was Proctor predisposed and nasty, but helps manipulate the evidence. Presumably, he's also going to try to show what they've said, that Michael Proctor had a close connection to the Albert family. That didn't seem to be the case from his direct testimony, but there is still cross-exam to go. Um, I've seen a lot of people ask, why does Michael Proctor still have a job? And I don't know the answer to that. Maybe because the case is still pending and they need him as a witness. Maybe because there's a bit of a boys will be boys attitude sometimes in law enforcement. Maybe because he has a substantial record enough to survive having done that. And frankly, having jeopardized a police investigation and a prosecution. And maybe because him and his family have been subjected to public attack and harassment throughout this case. And maybe they feel they've been punished enough. I don't know. That's really not the point right now. You know, you can attack, you can, you can be offended by what Proctor said and what he did and have a theory of the case 
All of that gets played out in front of a jury of Karen Reed's peers, and they get to make the decision. Can the prosecution rebound from this? It's possible. Listen, if the jury believes that Karen Reed killed John O'Keefe, they're not going to find her innocent because this guy sent disgusting text messages. But surely, surely Michael Proctor has made the job much harder for the Commonwealth, right? He has tainted the investigation. Um, I heard a lot of people say there's a heavily, this is a heavily female jury. I think 10 of the 17 are female, and I'm sure they were offended. I frankly think men and women should be offended by what was written. But, you know, women tend to hold women accountable. And if I was the prosecution, I wouldn't have been afraid and I still wouldn't be afraid about the fact that this is predominantly a female jury. If they think Karen Reed killed that man, they will hold her responsible. And again, this case comes down to the physical evidence. Is there physical evidence that John O'Keefe was killed by an SUV driven in reverse. I still haven't seen that evidence put on in this trial. And I suspect that's where the prosecution is gonna go through if they ever get past the Michael Proctor testimony. They're certainly not going to finish their case with this vile police officer and his text messages. They likely intend to put on their strongest evidence last. By the way, if we've seen their strongest evidence already, they're in a lot of trouble. So I expect that they have some sort of evidence to tie this together, both on Karen Reed's intent and upon physically whether it was true. And remember, again, as I've been saying on this case, you know, the defense has a great reasonable doubt case. But for some reason, they stood up an opening statement and said Karen Reed was framed for a murder she didn't commit. I don't know that Michael Proctor's texts support that theory. I don't think they show a conspiracy or a cover-up. They show perhaps that he was predisposed. They show perhaps a shoddy and biased investigation. That was also part of the defense opening. But I don't know that they show a frame job. Listen, we're not done yet. There's still much more to this trial. Don't believe anyone who tells you it's over. I looked at the jury yesterday and it's over. Don't buy that. There's still got to hear the rest of what the prosecution has to say and in fairness, what the defense has to say. Jurors are told not to make up their mind to the end and generally don't make up their mind to the end. But this was an enormous setback for the prosecution. There's no doubt about it. This police officer should not have been having texts with friends about an ongoing investigation. He should not have been making the statements or thinking the things that are reflected in those text messages. He has jeopardized an investigation. He has jeopardized a prosecution. And if Karen Reed goes free because of this, he may have to face the consequences. Will she go free? Remains to be seen, but we're going to keep on watching and keep coming to you here on True Crime MTN. Like us, subscribe to us, post all your comments, agree, disagree, or otherwise, go for it. I like to read them, whatever they say. I'm Rich Schoenstein, and we are adjourned. If you like this video, please like it and subscribe. I'm Dave Ehrenberg, a.k.a. the Florida Lawman, here on the fastest growing true crime channel, True Crime MTN. And we'll see you next time.